I, I don't know uh, if this happens on your smartphone, but mine recommends uh, articles for me to read. And one of the articles that caught my eye this week was from Business Insider. It was about a young man named Michael Lynn who had gotten a $450,000 a year job at Netflix as a senior software engineer. And at first, he really enjoyed the job, but you know, the pandemic hit and he realized during that time that a lot of what he enjoyed about the job was the social interaction and the friendships and those kinds of things. And that during the pandemic, all he had was the work. And he didn't really like that that much. It, it didn't fit his, his career goals. And so he, he tried to transfer within Netflix for a, a job that would fit his career goals better, but he couldn't get any of those jobs. And so after four years and with no plan in place, he left. Uh, how do you think the people in his life responded to that? Uh, notably, his parents and his mentor, you know, leaving a $450,000 a year job with no plan in place. Uh, could you do something like that? Uh, what makes it hard for many of us to imagine doing something like that? Let's pray. Father, uh, as we open your word this morning, uh, we ask that uh, you would speak words of life to us. Uh, I just am, am aware that your goal is not to shame us, uh, not to come down on us, but to lead us into the paths of life. So uh, help us, Lord, to look up from uh, the things that we have sort of tried to satisfy ourselves with and to look to you and to trust uh, that you really are the true treasure, the giver of life. So uh, open your word, Lord, and speak a word to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we have been in a series uh, called Kingdom Finances. We've been looking at the role of money in our lives, and especially uh, for those of us who are trying to be followers of Jesus, uh, to, to look at what it looks like to be faithful with money. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in this morning's passage is that where your money goes, your heart goes. And so this is part of why we're talking about finances, not because, oh, it's a really practical thing. And I mean, it is a practical thing, but we're talking about it because it, it tends to reflect what's going on spiritually for us. It tells us what we really trust in, how we really think of the good life and what we're really following. And so it's important for us to, to know about money and for it to find the proper place in our lives. And so we've, we've looked at all kinds of things. This has been a kind of a spread out series. So I thought I'd summarize some of the main things that we've seen uh, as, we've, as we've come together. Uh, the, the, the first and, and foundational thing that we talked about was that everything belongs to God. Uh, all the things that we call ours, all the things that we think of as our own come from God and ultimately belong to him. Uh, secondly, we saw how money and wealth are intended by God as a blessing uh, to provide for our needs and to participate in the work God is doing in the world. So we don't need to avoid money and wealth. And that might seem like a silly thing to say, except that 
Uh, there was a time, actually a pretty lengthy time in the first part of my Christian life where I really did feel like money was bad. Uh, you don't want to, uh, to fall under the spell of money, have it become an idol in your life. So I just vo avoided it. And I was pretty good at avoiding it, apparently. And we don't need to avoid money. In fact, God is the one who gives us the power to create wealth, you know, to make money. And he expects us to learn to handle it well. So we don't have to be afraid of money and we don't have to avoid it. However, this is a third thing, money is not neutral. And sometimes you'll hear people in my position uh, saying, you know, money's neutral. It's, it's just a question of what you do with it. I do think it's important what you do with it. Money can be used for good and it can be used for not good. But money is not neutral. Uh, we'll see that again in this morning's passage. Money wants us to worship it. Money will try to seduce us away from God and to get us to trust in its promises. We looked, this is a fourth thing, we looked at how tithing is a spiritual discipline that reminds us that everything comes from God and belongs to him. So tithing is, is giving uh, a symbolic portion of your income as a reminder that everything comes from God and belongs to him. Uh, traditionally, that was a tenth, and that's what a tithe means, is a tenth, but it doesn't have to be a tenth. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was a tenth, uh, but certainly you're allowed to go above that. Uh, and if you're not able to do a tenth at this point, I think God knows our hearts as we work our way to, to being faithful in him. And I think that tithing, I think this is biblical, that tithing and all of our giving are meant to be voluntary and joyful. That is a reflection of God's generous heart. We give because God gives, and we're supposed to image him in the world. And so it matters how we give. We are not supposed to give uh, reluctantly or grudgingly or under compulsion. Because God gives generously. He gives with a free and joyful heart. And that's how we need to learn to give. All right. Uh, finally, we, we've talked more recently about using money as a way to be part of what God is doing in the world. Uh, we talked about a couple of ways that you could do that. Uh, on one Sunday, we talked about caring for those in need. And God so closely identifies with those in need that he says that when we do it to them, it's like doing it to him. He also says that when we don't do it to them, it's like not doing it for him. Uh, and so I, you know, we, we need to be careful about how we look after those who are in need. Uh, a second thing that we talked about, a uh, way to participate in God's work in the world, is to use money to make friends with people that they might experience the love of God and come to know him, that they might welcome us into eternal dwellings. And we talked about how we have money for a limited time only, but we can use it in ways that will that will benefit us and others for eternity. And one of the ways that we do that is by making friends with our money, you know, with using money to make friends with people. Okay. Uh, this morning, we're gonna take a look at Luke chapter 12 and what has been known as the parable of the rich fool. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them with me to Luke chapter 12. Um, we're going to start in verse 13, and I keep, uh, let's see. Okay. 
Luke 12, starting in verse 13, it says that someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, You there, uh, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over the two of you? But he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one is affluent or when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. We'll stop there and reflect for a moment. So there's either a guy or maybe a couple of them that come to Jesus hoping that he will arbitrate, hoping that he will settle a uh, family dispute over the inheritance. And Jesus refuses, but he spots something and calls it out. The danger of greed. And he warns this man or these, these people to examine their hearts and reminds them that life does not consist in, in one's possessions, even if you have a bunch of them. Now, earlier in the series, we reflected on how money can behave like an alternate God, you know, trying to secure our loyalty, our faith, and our worship. And here, we can see this in action. Money is talking to this guy or these people. Uh, he's telling him or them, I am your life. Real life, abundant life, depends on me, requires me. If you lose me, you're going to lose your life. And I think many of us have heard that voice. I think it's what makes it hard for us to imagine doing what Michael Lynn did and walking away from a $450,000 a year job. I want to be clear that I'm not giving a blanket endorsement of what he did. Don't go out and quit your job with no plan unless God's leading you to do that. I'm certainly not endorsing his particular reasons for doing that. That would be a larger and more nuanced discussion. My point is that giving up a high paying job with no alternative I'm sorry, with no alternative in hand, seems crazy to many of us. It's unthinkable. Uh, because money is that important to us. I, if, if I were Michael Lynn, I, I probably would have been thinking, I wonder if I could just go a couple more years. It'd be like almost a million more dollars. I, I, think, I, could, I think I could do that. <laughs> you know, we, we have to examine our hearts. But I know that in my heart, I think I still sort of believe, or at least there's a part of me that still sort of believes that money is that important. Now, clearly... Uh, <laughs> I haven't arranged my life very well to, to uh, maximize my earning potential. But it doesn't mean that there's not a part of me that still kind of has an ear for that kind of lie. And that's what it is. Jesus says, money is deceiving you. He says, even when we have an abundance, our lives do not consist of our wealth and possessions. Now, a survey of the lives of wealthy people demonstrates that even when one has a lot of money and things, that the good life is not assured. And from Howard Hughes to John Belushi to Kurt Cobain, we see that there have been a lot of wealthy people who had a lot of stuff who didn't even think their lives were worth living. Robin Williams was worth $50 million 
when he took his own life. He left the 50 million to his wife and children. And so they had this huge windfall of money. And what did they do? They fought over it. They went to court. Uh, don't believe the lie. Money is meant to be a blessing and it can be useful for many things. It's a terrific tool, but a terrible master. Don't let what was meant to be a blessing destroy your life. All right, we're going to continue on in Luke 12, starting in verse 16. It says that Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began thinking to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crop? And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones and I'll store all my grain and my goods there. And I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years to come. R relax, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your soul is demanded of you and all that you have prepared, who will own it now? Such is the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich in relation to God. So Jesus' conclusion is that this guy is a fool. Yet there are all kinds of ways in which he doesn't seem like a fool. He is a good farmer. He knows how to make the land productive. And he's a savvy businessman who can strategize a workable retirement plan. And he's thinking ahead and trying to, to plan wisely. It doesn't sound foolish. And I don't think that it's his managing of his business and money that makes him foolish. So what is it? How does someone so smart end up being a fool? I, I think for a lot of years, and maybe still, I don't know, but for a lot of years, I think my parents thought that I was the, the, the dumbest smart person that they had ever met. Like, I'm really, <laughs> I get a really high IQ. Um, I, I, I can solve puzzles and... I know lots of things and I, I can think about things, but they just thought you have, and they actually said, you, you have no common sense. Um, how is it that someone can be so smart or clever and end up a fool? Well, I think there are a few things with this guy. So one is that it says that he's, thinking to himself uh, in previous trans in other translations of this, it, it, it says that he is talking to himself. So he's, he's, he's thinking about stuff. He's, he's trying to figure out what would be the right move. And he doesn't pray to God. He doesn't ask God for wisdom, who the Bible says will give wisdom to everyone who asks. He doesn't consult with people that have walked this path before who might be able to help him see into his blind spots. He does everything himself. And so I think that's one way in which he's foolish. Second thing is he acts like he's got unlimited time or at least a long time. And so Jesus calls him a fool. You know, is that a harsh assessment? Well, not in light of his reality. When you, when you realize that we're the readers, and so we know stuff that the, that the guy himself didn't know, but we know that his life is ending tonight. And so 
you know, making all these plans for how he's going to store up more and then he's going to sit back and just live off of it and have a great life. It's silly. But aren't many of us like that? Like, we know that God is important. But he never feels urgent. And we figure that we'll get to him eventually. The truth is that most... Uh, let me start that again. The truth is that our lives are relatively short. And for the most part, we are not in control of how long we're going to be here. And so let me ask you, if your life ended tonight, will it have made sense? Were you thinking that you were going to take care of some other things first and that you'd get around to God eventually? You just haven't gotten there yet. Um, you know, it, maybe it started in college, you know, I, I'm so busy studying and, and doing college things. I will get to God, uh, as soon as I graduate. And then you get out, you get your first job and it's a lot of work and you're trying to impress and sort of establish yourself. You need to get established in your career. And so you put off God again and you tell yourself though, that once you're settled, then you're going to prioritize God. Uh, you find someone, you fall in love, you get married, uh, but that's a lot of work and you start having children and there, there are all these demands. And, and when are you thinking that you'll have time for God to be the priority? The reality is that we don't know, like I'm not trying to pronounce a curse over you or anything. We just don't know how long our lives are. And we have to live for God now. We, we have to, we have to be faithful now. And we need to live our lives in light of the reality of our mortality and of eternity because that is reality. So this guy's foolish because he talks to himself and not to God and others. Uh, he's a fool because he's living as if his time is unlimited. And then the third thing is that his concept of the good life is all about himself and his wealth and doing what he wants. And so naturally that, that leads him to store up treasure for himself. He is not rich in relation to God. Now, what does it mean to be rich in relation to God? Well, from the context of the story, it's the opposite of storing up treasure for yourself, as if life consists of how much money and how many possessions we can collect. Being rich in relationship to God means learning to see God as the true treasure, to seeing him uh, as worthy of our wholehearted pursuit. Jesus says in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that we might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So, is it okay to ever save, you know, to invest for retirement. Uh, in, in, a, in a handout we gave out earlier in the series, the article was critical of people who are part of the uh, financial independence retire early community. You know, they, they compared them to this guy in Luke chapter 12 and said, it's, it's, it's wrong to store up goods for yourself. And uh, to think that later you'll sit back and just live off of it, that's, that's wrong. Um, I think that's partly right, and I think it's also partly wrong. I told you I didn't agree with everything in that article, and this is what I meant by that. 
I actually think that saving for retirement and investing for retirement are not only okay, I think it's prudent. I think we should do that. Like a farmer who doesn't eat all of the seed and just pray that God will provide for the next season, there, a farmer is supposed to save some of the seed to plant. And I think that we are supposed to save part of what God is entrusting to us now to invest for later so that there will be something not just for ourselves, but for the work of God and for those in need for a long time. So I want to say yes, uh, that it's okay to save up for retirement. It makes sense to plan ahead. It would be wise to plan ahead. But let me ask this question too. Why are you saving? Why are you investing? Is it because you think that if you have enough, then you'll have a great life? Because if that's why you're saving it, that's a problem. Uh, there is a way of saving and investing with trust in God. And there is a way of saving and investing as an alternative to trusting in God. And obviously, we don't want that second one. Uh, we want everything to be about trusting in God and seeing him as the treasure. Let me ask another question. Are you ready to give up part of it or all of it if God requires it? I can't remember the exact number anymore, but I think Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, had a retirement that was worth like 1.5 to $2 million. And then he felt led by God to start a, a Christian graduate school. I don't think it actually went, I don't think it really took off, but he, he felt led. And so um, he saw that retirement and he, he said, isn't it wonderful? that God has, has set aside this money so that we can start this graduate school. I, I think it's wise for us to save and to invest for the future, but you don't know what God's gonna do. And we have to be open to how God wants to use that money. It's his money, right? Everything belongs to God. And what we want to do is participate with him in the world and do, being a part of what he's doing. All right, so what is the application of this passage? Well, Jesus himself actually tells us. I'm going to read it and then maybe pull out a few, uh, a few points that we can actually apply. Jesus says to his disciples, for this reason I tell you, do not worry about your life as to what you'll eat, nor your body as to what you are to wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, that they neither sow nor reap, they have no storeroom, no barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a day to his lifespan. Therefore, if you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about the other things? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither labor nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying, for all these things are what the nations of the world eagerly seek. Everybody's looking for that stuff. And your Father knows that you need these things. 
but seek first his kingdom and these things will be provided to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, because your father has chosen to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make purses. I'm sorry. <laughs> Obviously, I've done this in a different version. Make yourselves money belts that do not wear out and an inexhaustible treasure in heaven uh, where no thief comes near nor does a moth destroy. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there's that thing about where your money goes is where your heart will go. All right, so what can we apply? Well, number one, do not worry. Uh, that's not the same thing as never planning. Like he also says not to worry about what you'll eat or what you'll wear, but you can plan your diet or your wardrobe. You just shouldn't become obsessed. You shouldn't worry about it. God knows what we need and we can trust him to provide it. And that's the second thing. We need to trust God's heart. God's generous. God's not going to cheat us. He's not going to, he's not going to try to get away with giving us as little as possible. In Romans 8, it says that he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Third application, we can sell our possessions and give to charity. Uh, it doesn't say here that you have to sell all your position, possessions and give to charity. He did say that to a guy. Um, but this is making an investment in heaven, uh, putting your money in a place where it cannot be stolen or ruined or go down 20% like the stock market has recently. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Give, give to organizations, give to those in need. Trusting God is not just a heart attitude. It's not something that we do on the inside while nothing changes on the outside. It is a course of action. Faith is always like that. Faith isn't just doctrines that you, that you believe. Faith is someone that you trust with your life. And then Jesus says, seek God's kingdom. God's kingdom is God's rule as king. When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he teaches them to pray, your kingdom come. And what does that mean? Well, it means your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If, if God is the king, then his will should be the will of the land. And the land is the whole earth. God's desire is that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, which is to say completely, joyfully, and with recognition that his way is good. He's looking out for us. He's trying to give life and not to take our lives away. So again, seeking God's kingdom is not just an attitude. It's not like, well, in my heart, God is first. It's like, no, uh, seeking God's kingdom is about the goals that we set. It's about how we spend our time, how we arrange our schedule. It's about how we conduct our relationships. It's about how and where we use our money. Final thing I'll leave you with is this from 1 Timothy verses, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 6 verses 17 through 19. Paul tells Timothy, instruct those who are rich in this present world, not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up 
for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I think my old version said that which is life indeed. Some of you are thinking, well, that's fine for the rich people. That's not me. Uh, well, uh, that may be a little bit true, and certainly uh, there are other ways to give, to give of your time, to give of your giftedness. But let me challenge you on the financial end of things, because almost all of us in this congregation and living in this part of Canada, we are like in the top 10% of the world's you know, finances, <laughs> um, we have a lot. And I, I want to challenge us to, to give from what we do have and not from what we don't have. If you're not a billionaire, as I am not, then you don't have to give a billion dollars. But what we are entrusted with is what we have to be faithful with. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gifts of life and all of the resources that you entrust to us. And we recognize, Lord, that that is not indefinite. Uh, there is an end point to this life. And I pray that we would live with that end point in mind, to live faithfully today and not keep pushing off faithfulness to some time in the future. I pray, Lord, that we would learn to see you as the treasure and to live our lives that way, seeking you as the treasure and not seeking money and things uh, as the treasure. Uh, money and things are meant to be our tools, powerful tools, uh, to do your will in the world. I pray that you'd help us to get the order of things right, that money would be the tool and that we would not be the tool that is being used by money. So help us, Lord, to lean into you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.